of Protocol Berg, um, our first edition. Uh, super happy to see everybody's faces here. Um, I'm Helena, your host for the next few sessions. Um, I'm a core member of the DOD. I also work at Scroll. Um, some of you may know that I started my journey at Parity Tech, so it's a great honor to introduce the next speaker. Gavin Wood, co-founder of Ethereum, founder of Polkadot, here to talk about Agile Core Time. Hello. Um, yes, where's the plug? OK. Uh, you actually get two talks today. Um, I only found out quite recently that it was, I was on for 15 minutes, so uh, I hastily put together um, a sort of uh, starter aperitif uh, talk, um, which shouldn't take too long. But I think it's, it's, it's nice. It points out a few things that, uh, that I think are quite fun to point out. And uh, oh, dear. All right, this stays on, and then uh, and then I'll proceed to like the uh, the the meat and potato uh, talk. Am I on? Yes. Okay. F. Right. Lovely to be back in Berlin. Everyone from uh, are we all like uh, uh, living here, uh, or are people travelling from far far away to come? One, two. From where? Near. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, good. So yeah, this first talk is, um, oh, you can see if you want to look at the slides, there's an URL. Um, this first talk is, is sort of uh, discussing uh, some of the uh, uh, conversation points that have been um, floating around uh, in this industry uh, of late. Um, and uh, particularly uh, from the polka dot perspective. Um, actually, uh, you know, polka dot's the sort of top level stuff. Uh, then, you know, I don't know how familiar you are with this stuff, but um, polka dot's more of us like a, a, a wider network, um, maybe an ecosystem. Um, substrate is the uh, a tech that we use to make blockchains that sort of slot in. Uh, to Polkadot, and then within this blockchain framework, we have a, um, a, a, a framework specifically for building the business logic of blockchains uh, called Frame. And that, for what it's worth, inside of Frame, there are also smart contract modules that allow you to have smart contract systems. What I'm going to talk about for now is Frame. So just bear in mind that Frame is uh, a piece of Substrate, which itself is a piece of Polkadot. Um, and at each of these levels, they are, in principle, replaceable. All right. So, uh, account abstraction, a bit of a hot topic at the moment uh, in some circles. What do we mean by account? Uh, well, generally, we mean an identifier for uh, a caller, like a, a caller of a function, some logic, uh, typically sitting inside of some um, uh, uh, decentralized uh, system. And uh, we usually use accounts to confer particular privileges. Um, for example, the ability to spend some balance that's sitting in some account. Um, in principle, accounts uh, uh, might be viewed as, as something that's quite homogenous, which means to say they all confer the same class of privilege, uh, but just a different um, specific parameter to it. Um, though that's not necessarily always, always needs to be the case. This is sort of based around the Ethereum um, account model. Let's look at this within the Polkadot um, uh, perspective. Um, so we have the concept of uh, an account-based um, uh, privilege level, an account caller, caller that we describe by a specific 32-byte, um, in Polkadot's case, identifier, um, what we call a signed um, account origin. Now, this is actually a type of a wider data structure called the system origin. System origin is an origin that is um, amongst basically all substrate chains and certainly all frame chains. All frame chains have a, this, this kind of caller, kind of privilege set in mind. The system origin is actually a subtype 
of the runtime origin. So the runtime origin is actually an extensible origin kind. System origin is one of those kinds of origins that you can have, but there are many others. And in fact, as I say, it's extensible, which means you can add your own. You make a new module, which we call a palette uh, in uh, frame language. If you, make a, if you make your own module, you can add your own kinds of origins. And obviously, these kinds of origins can confer certain privileges according to your particular use case. Now, as it happens, the runtime origin is, is also um, sort of ensconced in an even larger, uh, more uh, richer uh, origin type called the XCM origin. And the XCM origin is, is very large and very rich. And in principle, um, the language that we use, XCM is really just a language, um, uh, with this origin, you can describe, we one would hope, um, pretty much any caller uh, privilege class on any um, decentralized system. So, cue video. Um, I think it's, this is a sparring program. We turn it Similar up. to the programmed reality of the Matrix. It has the same basic rules, rules like gravity. What you must learn is that these rules are no different than the rules of a computer system. Some of them can be bent. Others can be broken. Uh, that's an excerpt from a, uh, a notable film. First practice in Singapore, and there was a scarlet tinge. Turn it down. <laughs> uh, that's an excerpt from a notable film called The Matrix. Um, uh, great film. Uh, what your man here is talking about uh, is trying to explain to this young Padwan um, that, in fact, what he believed was the real world that had all of these very uh, particular um, rules that could not be broken um, is, in fact, merely a simulation. And he has some um, godlike privileges within this simulation, which if he were only to wake up, um, he could realize and alter some of these fundamental rules. Um, he mentions bending some and breaking others. As far as I know, he only ever really broke them. But uh, yes, in Polkadot, we have um, a similar um, kind of situation. Um, whereas Morpheus mentioned gravity as being a rule, um, that could be broken if, if only Neo understood in the Matrix. Well, um, the account model in uh, Polkadot, while it may look as though it's uh, very similar to a hard-coded account model like the one in Ethereum, in fact, it's much more like the Matrix situation. And if only you uh, learn the underlying frame language, you will see that you can bend or even break uh, many of the rules concerning the account system. So let's go back to the uh, origin example. So if we remind, origin in the polka dot world, in the frame world specifically, um, helps us understand who is calling this piece of logic that is being called, we would assume, in a decentralized, perhaps permissionless system. Well, we've already mentioned the signed origin. The signed origin tells us, well, this account, this account has signed a transaction. They're the ones who are calling it. Well, there are other origins. One of them is the root origin, which I can imagine uh, many, uh, uh, many a Unix user here can probably guess what it means. Um, the root origin confers all possible privileges to um, the code that this caller is attempting to have called. No one can sign for the root origin. That wouldn't make any sense at all, would it? Like, if you had a, a sign, well, if you had a signature that could just alter anything on the chain, no. Um, although we do have a module called sudo that does allow you to confer the root privileges if you so choose. This is useful for permissioned um, ledgers. Normally, the root origin um, would be an origin um, that can be only called with the execution of some logic to ensure that it's in the blockchain's overall interest, for example, governance. I have a bunch of other origins here. The treasury origin has the privileges of being able to spend the treasury. Uh, the collective members origin represents some proportion of members from a collective. Yeah, this is still a, an endpoint. This is still like a caller type. Um, but we're not being specific about who or which account is calling. All we're saying is, well, some collective exists. Maybe it's got 100 members. And we know that maybe 80 of them um, actually want this thing done. And this allows us to build all sorts of very interesting, sophisticated governance structures. 
We also have a, a, um, a caller type parachain. This means that the parachain wants this. Again, this is impossible to really, you know, it doesn't really make sense to think of it in terms of an account. Um, parachain doesn't necessarily hold an account. But it is nonetheless a logical um, uh, means of calling some code. Person would be another one. XCM would be another, like a message that's arrived from some random location somewhere on the um, uh, decentralized logic sphere. All right, let's look at specific non-problems then. Transaction batching. Suppose we want to execute several transactions all at, all at once, all one after the other, from a particular endpoint, be it an account or something else. Well, actually, it turns out that this is really easy in frame. In fact, it's a very small little um, uh, transaction type called utility.batch. And this is part of a module that anyone can add. As I say, our modules are called palettes. You can sort of upload um, a, uh, a, a palette um, and, and agree that it should be part of a blockchain. Account delegation. Again, already implemented, utility.proxy, part of the same module, as it happens. Uh, Multisig or threshold signatures. Well, yeah, surprise, surprise, this is already um, uh, implemented. Account uh, utility.multisig. Um, suppose we want to do account recovery on a lost secret key. So you've lost your secret key. This secret key represents some particular account, right? The, the hash of the public key, whatever it is. Um, but you, uh, you've lost it, and you, you've set up some social recovery system, but you would like to reclaim um, not just any of the assets associated with it, but like all of the privileges, right? Um, maybe, uh, I don't know, I had some identity thing associated with it, or I had some other um, um, particular, I don't know, um, associations. Um, and you need to be able to control the actual account. Well, you can't obviously a magic up the secret key, um, but in the frame framework, that account can just be used, uh, can be, can be um, regained through a, a pretty trivial call um, to this social recovery palette. What else have we got? Exotic signatures. Well, in frame, signatures are not really uh, um, a fixed thing. They're not hard coded. Um, there's actually just this interface called Verify. And uh, currently, we have three different signature types. And if you wanted to add another, maybe something that is um, uh, resistant to uh, new forms of, uh, uh, of technology, then it's possible to um, just slot it in. Now, suppose we want to do that, but we don't necessarily want to alter the underlying um, blockchain um, uh, uh, sort of um, system. It's also put doable from within a module itself using signed extension. Now, signed extension is something that allows us to alter the transaction format in a modular manner, in a very extensible manner. And in fact, this was used um, when we needed to be able to allow uh, individuals uh, that had a sort of dot balance um, uh, 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 held by an ETH account, um, like a 20-byte um, uh, Ethereum address. Um, uh, and we wanted them to be able to claim these dot balance within uh, Polkadot, which obviously doesn't sort of understand what, what's going on in the, in the ETH world. Um, and it was, it, it was pretty trivial in the end, um, using these, uh, these cunning extensions. Um, it didn't matter in particular that they didn't already hold dots and that they didn't have um, to make their account exist and that they didn't um, have any dots to pay for any transaction fee. Suppose you want to pay fees in a non-native token, another um, sort of hot, hot topic. Well, in frame, paying fees isn't part of the protocol. It's, it's actually an extension itself. There is something called the um, transaction fee module, transaction fee palette. It's a palette that you can sort of slide in to your chain if you so want. And one of the things that it allows you to do is to configure whether fees should be paid as part of a transaction. They don't have to be. So if you want to pay fees in some other way or, or have some other anti-spam mechanism for your chain, it's pretty trivial. Um, paying someone else's fee. Little more involved, uh, well, OK. A little more involved, practically speaking, as far as the on-chain part goes, it's pretty trivial. Um, but of course, getting, uh, transmitting the thing that you want someone else to uh, pay for um, is, is a little bit harder. You need some sort of uh, off-chain message passing kind of gossip system. 
um, which uh, uh, is, is not especially uh, 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 easy to um, come up with. But nonetheless, uh, once that is done, um, the actual on-chain bit of, of ensuring that you can actually pay for someone else's transaction, easy, easy peasy. What about uh, accounts always needing a balance for gas fees? Well, again, as I mentioned earlier, signed extension. Really easy. Now, actually, Frame has an even easier way of doing this if you just want to make sure that they don't have to pay for some transactions under certain circumstances. You can, it's as easy as returning pays no from the transaction code. It just means the system picks up the tab. So yeah, um, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of stuff that you can do if you free yourself, free your mind, um, from, the, uh, from the idea that the, the account model is sacred and, and can never be, um, uh, uh, can never be uh, altered under any circumstances. And systems like Frame allow this to happen in an incredibly um, easy uh, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, modular manner. OK, good. This is, uh, this is the first uh, little thing I wanted to cover. And as far as I know, I'm 20 minutes in? Hmm? All right, I'll have to hurry up a little bit then. Right, Agile Core Time. Um, now, I presented the, the beginnings of this uh, back um, at Polkadot Decoded, I don't know, two, two months ago or so. Um, it's, it's a bit of a... It's an interesting uh, sort of um, uh, mental uh, journey, so s stay with me. What is Polkadot? What is Polkadot 1? Right, well, if you go back to the uh, white paper, Polkadot, it says, is a scalable, heterogeneous, multi-chain, blockchain of blockchains, right? That's how we uh, define Polkadot. Uh, that's what we aimed to build uh, with Polkadot, and that largely is what has been uh, what is out there now, called Polkadot. Um, so here is my uh, back of the napkin drawing of that. There's the relay chain in the middle, and there's these little you know, chains on the outside. They're the parachains, for those who are not familiar with Polkadot terminology. But they're just blockchains, right? They're blockchains, and the crucial thing is that these blockchains get all of their work checked by Polkadot, and as such, share their security guarantees um, with Polkadot. Now, if, let's dig a bit deeper, because that, that, that's all very well, but it doesn't really explain to us um, what we have done to achieve this goal. Well, the first thing that Polkadot does is it procures certain information technology and communication, should be a C in there really, resources from the public. Um, now, we call these uh, resource providers validators, and they do particular jobs for the Polkadot network. In general, they just run a particular piece of code that does the right thing. Um, there are certain resource requirements that these validators, these members of the public, um, must provide in order to make things work and get paid, basically. Now, given that Polkadot is able to procure uh, these resources from the public validators, it then provides an environment, a platform, um, to resiliently ensure that these little blockchains, the ones on the outside, uh, and state machines that seem like them, so there's a, there's a certain class of machines that, that it can do this for, um, but they're, blo they're generally blockchains or blockchain-like things, that they progress properly, right? That they're, they're, when they, then they get to the next block and they say, well, this happened, um, that, that this, is, is, is that they, they're, they're saying happened, actually did really happen and was a legitimate um, um, event or a legitimate um, um, uh, course of action. So how does it do it? Well, it uses cryptography in part and a lot of economic, quite sophisticated economic games um, to guarantee this, right? 
to check that these progressions of the little ones, the little chains, um, are right, are correct. And it, it verifies what they're doing, so it basically replays all of this logic, and it chronicles it, it, it records it, um, so that in case there is a dispute later on, um, we can go back and we can check the working again. Um, now, we've got a lot of logic, it turns out, <laughs> turning these 1,000 members of the public, volunteers almost, I mean, they get rewarded, but they are volunteering to get rewarded, um, into this particular resource for verifying and chronicling this computation. And there is a bit of logic dedicated to um, doing, making, uh, making the environment right to ensure that this secure, reliable, and accurate resource actually works for blockchain things, rather than may maybe other things. So we've been very, um, we've basically optimized the situation um, for blockchains, for, for checking blockchains. This was the whole idea with Polkadot 1, right? But as a byproduct, it turns out, Polkadot has these logical virtual machines that kind of are spread around the globe, different randomly selected validator sets hosting them. And it uses these logical units, these, these virtual machines, decentralized virtual machines, um, at the moment uh, to secure blockchains, to secure parachains, to secure the blockchains of the Polkadot ecosystem, checking their correctness, chronicling what's happening. But they didn't do that necessarily. They could do all sorts of things these cores, yeah? They are, at the end of the day, basically just virtual machines that are guaranteed to operate correctly. So in fact, what we've inadvertently created with Polkadot 1 um, isn't uh, uh, the overarching uh, multi-chain uh, network, or that is one of the things that we've created, but the inadvertent thing that we've created is actually just high resilience validated computation. So if we look at Polkadot as a ubiquitous multi-core computer, well, we can start describing what this computer does. Like, we can describe its parameters. What is this virtual machine capable of? Well, it turns out that we can have um, potentially hundreds of these little units all operating in parallel, these cores. And the core bandwidth, it turns out, is about a megabyte a second. So it can do a megabyte a second of I.O. with the rest of the world. And if you want to uh, get an idea for how much computation it can process, well, it turns out it's got a Geekbench 5 um, SC single threaded uh, uh, score of about 380. And it takes about six seconds if you want to get things in and out. And overall, we would expect this to track hardware. So as hardware gets better, these numbers will go up. Now, as I said, this core resource, we've kind of limited it to, to a particular model of computation, which we might call the parachain model. It's, it's very optimized for blockchain-like systems because, you know, that was the whole, use, that the whole point of creating this. That was the use case. Um, and the parachain model extends to how the resource is procured. It's procured through long-term leasing, auctions, deposits, crowd loans. But it doesn't necessarily need to be this way. We may yet be able to expose these same underlying resources, this high-quality, resilient, multi-core um, compute uh, 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 um, units um, in a more general way. Why? Why would we bother doing it? Sounds like work. Well, two reasons. First, economic efficiency. We've got this resource, and it's, it's a pretty decent resource. And we're currently taking the resource and just baking it into one particular service, one particular product. It's kind of like we've got, we're, we're, we've got like, I don't know, a big farm, and we're producing out of flour and seeds and water and stuff. And uh, we're, we're taking this flour and seeds and water and yeast and whatnot, and we're baking it into one specific type of bread. 
when in fact there is the whole world of French pastry that we're completely missing. Um, if we always bake it into one particular kind of bread, and it turns out that this particular kind of bread isn't uh, exactly what everybody wants, um, then uh, there is economic inefficiency. We are also motivated by technological flexibility, the ability to prototype new things with this decentralized, resilient um, compute resource. We want to open up the design space, ideally beyond the core development team into the hands of everybody. Because ultimately, every particular usage of this resource implies some design decisions, implies opinionation. And as soon as you're opinionated, you kind of block off a lot of the potential, uh, well, a lot of the potential. So rather than uh, fixing this opinionated design decisions, let's try and wind it back. Just provide the underlying resource in as pure a form as possible. So this is where agile core time comes in. And it, agile, we mean two different kinds of agile. We mean agile procurement, and we also mean agile utilization. At the moment, procurement is not agile. It's very heavily centered around long-term usage of one particular core. And utilization isn't very agile either. It's a bit better, I would say, but it's still not super agile. It's still optimized for um, utilizing a core for a particular um, uh, um, uh, compute um, uh, machinery, in this case, blockchains, or verification of blockchains specifically. All right, so let's talk about procurement. Cores are agile. Procurement should be agile as well. Um, so we have two Polkadot native sales for core time, by which we mean time on a core of the Polkadot multi-core computer. Bulk sales, which is basically four weeks of core time sold at a time, so these kind of like big chunks of core time, not that big, monthly, um, which is a lot less than what we're doing currently, which is two, two yearly, um, and instantaneous core time. Now this, this sort of um, short circuits um, a lot of the, the, the monthly, this bulk core time logic, and goes directly into the relay chain and says, actually, I'm owed a block right now, here's the work. I'm all, I'm out of core right now, I should say. So let's look at bulk sales, four weekly sale. So we do a monthly sale of a month long amount of core time. We do it just sort of, I don't know, a few weeks before the core time is due to begin. We target some amount of cores that we want to sell. If we sell fewer than them, then we can, we can basically adapt the price. Price goes down. If we sell more, price goes up. Um, an unrented cause go into the instantaneous market for use on an immediate level. Special considerations for pre-existing tenants, block, uh, parachains. Compare that to instantaneous sales. So this is a blockly, by which I mean every block, um, sale of bulk core time. So there's a price. And this sort of moves up and down according to demand. Um, and basically, you're able to uh, purchase bulk core time at uh, you know, one or two blocks before you're going to actually utilize it. Um, as I mentioned, there's an automatic market maker to regulate the price, targeting the all of 100% usage. So if there's um, uh, plenty of supply, this price is going to be pretty low. And the idea is that if you've got some spare bulk core time, um, you can put it in the market and kind of sell it through this mechanism. And then the total sale will be, uh, um, will be split between the core time providers. Now, bulk core time is a pretty interesting thing. And it may be the first legitimate usage of an NFT. Um, 
Now, the idea is that the call time service exposes um, through XCM, and XCM has a sort of NFT interface, um, exposes these tokens. Um, they're non-fungible. They represent some particular um, claim on a Polkadot multi-core computer on, a, on one of the cores. And in fact, it's not just like on one of the cores sometime. It's like on one of the cores between time x until time y um, at regularity r, like at frequency, if you like. One in every two blocks, every, every block. One in every 10 blocks, this kind of thing. Now, when you buy bulk core time, you get an NFT that basically says, well, it's, it's on this core, it's four weeks, it starts on this, this time, ends four weeks later. And it's every block. But maybe that doesn't fit your use case. Maybe your use case, you actually need to use the core one in every four blocks um, for the first week of the month, and then one in every two blo blocks for the other three weeks of the month. Well, this allows you to do that, or indeed any, any random parameterization of that. Um, so you're able to split these NFTs up and make from one NFT that represents four weeks to two NFTs that represent, I don't know, one week and three weeks, or one day and 27 days, or whatever it is that you want to do. You can also take these NFTs and split them up further. You can do it as many times as you want. And even cooler, you can take NFTs and deinterlace them, like pull them apart. So you can make them two NFTs of each um, a regularity that sums to the original NFT. Yeah. So you can take, for example, an NFT that does it every uh, 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 two blocks from, for some period and turn it into two NFTs, each that do it every four blocks. And then you can put them in a market. It's just an NFT, like any other NFT. So you can auction them off, you can sell them, trade them, whatever. I mean, I don't know what, what stuff's out there for NFTs, but I presume it's like pretty sophisticated by now. So they can be moved between chains and treated basically like any other NFTs. And one can even imagine markets that sort of even reduce the non-fungibility of them, basically saying, yeah, sure, if you, want, if you want to buy something that's kind of roughly from this time to that time at roughly this regularity, there are these NFTs that are for sale at the moment. Yeah? Now you can consume bulk core time in two different ways. As I mentioned before, you can put it on the instantaneous market and take a cut of the profits. You can also assign it directly for utilization. Utilizing it may be, for example, dedicating it to some particular parachain. But there could be other uses. So let's, keeping that in mind, move on to Agile Core Times Utilization. Now, this is uh, very much an ongoing discussion. So I'm not going to try and present anything as being um, uh, kind of decided or, or anything like that. I think with the core time, with the uh, procurement, this is already coded and, and scheduled for, um, um, uh, um, for deployment onto the Polkadot network. With utilization, still working through th things through. Overall tenets, in my mind, are firstly to minimize changes. We want to use what we've got as much as we can. And secondly, to maximize potential. And part of potential, I would say, is permissionlessness. Try and like, ensure that um, as many people can utilize and rebake this resource as possible. So let's look at some of the ideas that we have for utilizing Agile Core Time. So the first one is the uh, Polkadot 1 model, parachain model. And we have three others, well, two-ish, two, uh, two, uh, two, two or three others that I want to talk about um, at the moment. One of them is the actor model. Another one is the map reduce model. And I'll talk a little bit about some more sophisticated models that are also under discussion. So just to be clear, this is alternate means of utilizing the underlying resource, this compute machinery, 
that Polkadot provides. One of them at the moment is to check the progression of blockchains, parachains. But there can be others. So let's look at the parachain model. What does it mean? Well, for those who are not familiar, on Polkadot, every parachain has a code blob associated with it. It's actually a, a piece of WebAssembly. When a parachain um, uh, wants to move forward and, and make sure that it's, uh, that it's verified through the Polkadot network, it submits a piece of data to the Polkadot network. We call this piece of data the proof of validity, or POV. Every parachain has a code blob known as the parachain validation function. As you can imagine, this validates a transition that a parachain does. Every proof of validity, basically a document that gets sent to the Polkadot validators, describes, well, it references one specific parachain, and it describes how it has moved forward, providing any necessary data that it might need as a validator of the Polkadot network to do it, to check its working. Witness data. These, um, this parachain validation function, this code blob, has a, a fixed entry point. It's called execute block. Um, and it's just one of them that gets used, just this execute block. So the proof of validity, this document, basically gets fed in to this entry point in the code blob, parachain validation function, and it gets checked to make sure it's correct. There is also some hard-coded logic that sits on the relay chain. This is, out, so this is like done sort of after these proof of validities have been checked, and it, it sort of manages any of the message passing. So this, in a nutshell, apologies for the uh, 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 jargon, but you know it's quite complicated, and I'm trying to boil it down. Um, this, in a nutshell, is what Polkadot is doing, how it's utilizing these cores in order to create this parachain-centric um, uh, 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 model where you can have multiple um, uh, uh, blockchains all operating under the same security umbrella. Now, how does this differ with the actor, actor model? which I'm calling core play. Well, we have one code blob per actor. So a bit similar to how we have one code blob per parachain. That bit doesn't really change. However, we can have multiple actors per POV, proof of validity. And at this point, maybe it's not so sensible to call it a proof of validity. Maybe we can just talk about it as a work package, right? some document that gets sent to the Polkadot validators. Hey, check this, validate this work package. Well, we can reference multiple actors in, in these work packages. Now, the work packages, the POVs, they have a manifest. And this allows us to specify which actors um, get sort of entered, get their code executed, when, in what order. So this is quite a lot more um, quite a lot more of a sophisticated compute model. And we can have multiple actors per POV, multiple entry points into those actors. As it happens, there's only really two. One of the entry points um, is to, to progress the actor, do more compute, have some more time on the, on the Polkadot um, computer. And another one is uh, do some I.O. Here's some input, give me some output. So there's actually only two entry points, but still, more than one. And it has upwards message passing, which is one of the message passing protocols, one to take it up to the uh, relay chain. This is hard-coded. OK, so this is the actor model. And with the actor model, we can do some pretty interesting stuff. Because we can have multiple actors per um, uh, work package, 
And because they, we know that they execute on the same core, and because we have a manifest that allows us to kind of switch between them, do some work in one, do some work in another, do a bit of I.O. in one, do a bit of I.O. in another, um, we can do some very interesting uh, composability. We can have actors that kind of speak to each other, and then the next block reconfigure themselves and do something else. More on that in a second. Before I, before I do that, uh, go into that a little bit more, I want to talk about the MapReduce model. So MapReduce is a um, pretty general paradigm for, uh, in particular, uh, representing a kind of workload that can scale well on, uh, on a homogenous um, um, uh, um, a parallelized compute system, somewhat similar to what Polkadot turns out to be. Um, this one is kind of project core cast. So it's a map reduce model for utilizing or for expressing the kind of computation that we want done on this Polkadot multi-core computer. So map and reduce, we have two different code blobs per work type. So work types are a little bit like parachains or actors. But instead of having one code blob, we have two. Well, when a work package comes in, what we used to call a POV, work package now, it names a particular work type. The map code blob, each of these code blobs only have one entry point, the map code blob is applied off-chain. This is the thing that gets checked. This is parallelized. Yeah? You have many different maps of the same work, time, all hap work type, all happening in parallel, all with different validated groups, all on different polka dot cores. Whereas reduce is applied on chain, synchronized. It's pretty much as you would expect for those familiar with map reduce. The verified outputs of map, so map has some smallish outputs, and these are used as inputs to the reduce function. And reduce can mutate some on chain um, uh, uh, data rot um, work type state tree, right, specific to the work type. It turns out this is quite general. We're also considering other more sophisticated models, maybe arbitrary dependency graphs between the work packages, asynchronous work package items, um, potentially even unbalanced resource usage, support for it, using more, for example, availability, uh, I.O. bandwidth, rather than compute, or different kinds of compute, GPU compute versus CPU compute. Very interesting stuff. OK, watch this space. Guess I've probably got five more minutes left. So. Uh, with five more minutes left, I would like to, can I full screen this? Full screen, uh, present. All right, I'd like to just go over core plane. Put something in your mind, because this is like a little bit more um, visual. Um, kudos to our very own Iggy for helping me with this stuff. This wasn't my fair hands, I'm afraid. This was a, a rather talented designer. Okay. Um, so, uh, core play. So this is a potential actor-based model visualized for your viewing pleasure uh, on Polkadot. Um, in this case, there are, uh, at the top there, there is the audience. This is the validators. They're, check they're, they're, they're watching everything, making sure that it's, uh, that it's proceeding correctly, right? We have our six stages. Now, the stages are basically cores. Yeah? Core represents a stage. There are six in this one, because there's six sort of blobs on the Polkadot logo. But in principle, there could be hundreds of these stages. If I drew hundreds, it would all, you wouldn't see the, the forest for the trees. So um, that's why there's only six. Actors sit on the stages acting. These are the active tasks, right? These are the things that are actually running at this particular block in time. Backstage are all the non-active tasks. Um, the non-active tasks, uh, uh, well, the actors are able to send messages uh, between each other um, uh, through this sort of XCMP tile type mail system. So they have like, I don't know, uh, pigeonholes, you can imagine it as. Now let's get onto this, the stage, because like, this is very, uh, a very interesting um, uh, 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 model for compute. So on any given stage, if you remember, a stage basically maps to a core 
in this actor model of using Polkadot Core Play. We have the backstage. Now we have a lift. The lift. You have to lift an actor up onto the stage, right? This is kind of like I.O. Uh, it's a bit like I.O., right? You have to get the actor's code out and kind of get, them, get the code out and get ready to use the code. So there's like a bit of resource cost for bringing an actor on the stage. And this needs to be paid for. And the stage, as I, as I said, sort of one-to-one -one maps with a core. And we have these actors. The actors are sort of sitting on the stage. And at any uh, given time, there is a spotlight. So there's some, some guy with a spotlight. And it can go between the actors. As it si shines on an actor, the actor executes. Right? So this is, we're only single core. So we can't, we can't have multiple actors all saying and thinking at once. So we have a spotlight to say which actor is actually acting, executing. But crucially, the actors can talk to each other synchronously. This allows us to do synchronous composition. We can do all sorts of rich um, frameworks when we know that the actors are executing in the same, um, the same execution environment. We know they're being executed by the same um, CPUs in the same piece of time. This, in a, uh, in a nutshell, is one of the ways that we can sort of see the underlying compute machinery, the underlying decentralized compute machinery of Polkadot being able to be used beyond simply hosting, uh, or rather verifying uh, blockchains. And I suspect if we, can, uh, if we are able to reframe um, Polkadot's resources in a, uh, uh, such that they can be used in a permissionless fashion, we will, this won't be the only thing that we see, uh, the only uh, sort of uh, means of utilizing uh, Polkadot's uh, underlying compute machinery um, beyond uh, verifying blockchains. I suspect there will be quite a few others. And with that, uh, my talk is at an end. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>